Black Star Network is is. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. Mm. You can't be Black media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? we mm-hmm.
Monday, April 8th, 2024, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Actor Jonathan Majors escapes jail but must undergo domestic violence counseling. Reporter Lauren Victoria Burke is in the courtroom in New York City. She'll tell us exactly what took place. A Florida jury finds a black man guilty of a DUI even after a white cop planted evidence during a May 2023 traffic stop. 
white conservatives are on a crusade against DEI programs in medical schools. Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton will explain how banning those programs could, uh, well, first of all, could lead to decades or crush decade long, long efforts to address health disparities. April is National Minority Health uh, Awareness Month. Uh, and of course, the focus is raising the importance of health and dealing with the racial uh, data that we see, or really racial apartheid that we see. Uh, tonight, we're gonna find out why black women are most vulnerable to dying after childbirth. And Haitian leaders have laid out a political plan to have a president sworn in by February 2026. And South Carolina goes undefeated and wins the Women's National Championship. Dawn Staley becomes the first black coach to ever win three national titles. Well, first at Division 1A. Tennessee State won three. And Vice President Kamala Harris honored them last week at the White House. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. No jail time for actor Jonathan Majors. Of course, he was convicted of misdemeanor assault. He will have to take uh, a 52-week mandatory in-person domestic violence program uh, for assault and harassment of his former girlfriend uh, during a domestic dispute. Law Victoria Burke of Black Press USA was in the courtroom in New York City. She joins us right now. Uh, Lauren, glad to have you here. So uh, exactly, exactly what took place here in terms of um, what we saw in the courtroom. What really went on here? Well, what went on was, of course, you know, you had a large degree of media there. Uh, Jonathan Majors had about 10 to 15 supporters sitting in the courtroom in the rows right behind him. He came in and he greeted those people and shook everyone's hand uh, before everything got going. Then there was a conference between the prosecution attorneys uh, and the his his defense attorneys. For a few minutes, uh, and then about I would say five minutes to 10 a.m. this morning, uh, his ex-girlfriend Miss Grace Jabari comes into court with like five people, and sits down in the rows uh, behind the prosecution side of the courtroom. Uh, and then the judge starts reading, and then gives Miss Jabari an opportunity to read a victim victim's impact statement, which was quite interesting. Uh, and then proceeded to uh, tell everyone that, after that was over, that uh, Mr. Majors would have to complete this 52-week program and then sort of announce some other standard uh, operating procedures with regard to what he can and cannot do. There was some restraining order. Uh, New York City does have that law with regard to if you are in some way involved in a domestic violence incident, you cannot own a firearm. So that was announced. And after that, Mr. Majors left. Uh, but I dare say that uh, it is interesting that, after all of this, it's a 52-week program, no jail time. One would think that this could have been settled a year ago. I mean, it is a, it is obvious that this was probably not going to be jail time. It is a misdemeanor uh, case, and very surprisingly, it played out for two weeks in full-blown trial. I would be curious to know how many of these types of cases play out in full-blown trial for a misdemeanor case. So, uh, for effectively, for Mr. Majors putting his ex-girlfriend in the back of an SUV, that, for me, is, is a bit much, particularly coming from a prosecutor, Alvin Bragg, who campaigned on this idea of restorative justice and not, uh, you know, he has that sort of progressive prosecutor type campaign that many other prosecutors have had around the country, that they would not just prosecute anything. It seems that this was a bit of an over-prosecution, to say the least. So, it was an interesting 
time in court. There was a tremendous amount of media there, probably more media than I think I had seen at any other time when I was in court before. I was a little surprised at that. I was naive. <laughs> so there was, there was plenty of press there. You called the impact statement interesting. Uh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> um, I think that uh, there were a few lines in the impact statement with regard uh, to Ms. Jabbar. I have to get the actual statement to quote directly. But um, there was something in there about, I will never rest, and he will do this to other women, and I will never rest until it is assured that I can stop him from doing that. Keep in mind that Megan Good is in the, in the courtroom. Uh, sitting in the front uh, row, uh, right behind Jonathan Majors. And uh, there were some lines in there about, uh, you know, she would never rest until all the facts came out and this and that. So I, I, do, I do think that Ms. Jabari has not gotten over this situation. She, is, uh, she has sued him civilly. Uh, there is a sense there that she's not over this and that she's kind of trying to figure out a way to be in his life. Uh, but the statement read, uh, you know, if, if you had landed here from another planet and you didn't know anything about Jonathan Majors and you heard that victim impact statement, you would think that this was a full-blown rape or sexual assault case and not a misdemeanor case in which the defendant was acquitted of all the intentional charges uh, and, and then has this thing that's a misdemeanor, you know, sitting there that typically is, is pled out of court. Uh, with no trial for most defendants. So her impact statement was quite interesting and quite lengthy. Uh, and I think that this is a person who has not completely gotten over this situation. Well, you, you, the point that you made about this, I mean, how this ended up, I mean, you're right. To think that this went through all of this and you came to this sort of sentence, this is typically a plea deal. Right. And a plea deal that could have happened and could have been offered a year ago. And as you already know, Roland, from interviewing uh, the girlfriend of Kevin Porter, uh, this is now the third time that a black male has been prosecuted by this office under Alvin Bragg on what I would define as some very questionable situation. Let me, before, before, I, I, first I, of all, I, you bring I, that up. You bring that up, the Kevin mm -hmm. Porter case. Guess what? That was a settlement. And you know what he got? Court ordered domestic violence treatment. Exactly. That, that was that was exactly. no that was no trial. That was no jury selection. That was no you know all of that. I mean, this, these were misdemeanor charges. Right. And so clearly there is a change in policy. We're dealing with a very young assistant DA that I believe got her uh, had passed the bar maybe three months before prosecuting Mr. Majors, uh, and is very young. And uh, I think that these people have no sense of what the history is when it comes to black men in the criminal justice system. They sure as hell like to talk a lot about other histories of other groups of people, which is all fine. I think people should be held accountable when we're talking about serious incidents involving domestic violence. There's nobody that's going to argue with that. Uh, but there was a, they brought, the prosecution brought a expert with regard to domestic violence, which is fine. That person talked about misogyny and the history of women and how they've been treated. All fine, all true. But somehow or another, when it comes to the history of the way black folks have been treated, and, and this specific case, black males in our criminal justice system, nobody wants to talk about that history. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit um, sort of glued to the fact that this all happened. And when I think of Adam Foss and Ke Kevin Porter, Adam Foss and Kevin Porter happened right before that, and now Jonathan Major. So one has to wonder, has Alvin Bragg brought a new policy to the Manhattan DA's, DA's office in which he is going to prosecute every argument, every time somebody yells at somebody, every time somebody places someone into a vehicle and then runs down the streets of Manhattan away from them, uh, which is what Jonathan Majors did. Is all that getting prosecuted now? <laughs> so that would be a change in policy. Well, uh, it is interesting when you um, uh, explain it that way. Uh, and so uh, what I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure, and for Jonathan Majors, uh, at, at this incident, significant uh, financial loss of movie roles, uh, TV roles, and now he has to, uh, frankly, put his career back together uh, because right. he was riding high before this took place. 
Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to be quite blunt. I think if his name was John Smith, none of this would have happened. There's a, there's a feeling here that this is being used as a vehicle to amplify uh, certain advocacy groups uh, and certain issues. Uh, and again, I think certainly there's nobody that's going to argue that we shouldn't be doing stuff about serious domestic violence. The question is, was this serious? And now this 52-week sentence with no jail time would indicate we could have done this last year. So I, I do think this is a very interesting moment. All right. Well, Victoria Burke, we sure appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, Got to go to a break. We'll be right back on Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million, and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, nurses are the backbone of the healthcare industry. And yet, only 7% of them are black. What's the reason for that low number? Well, a lack of opportunities and growth in their profession. Joining us on the next Get Wealthy is Needy Bartonilla. She's going to be sharing exactly what nurses need to do and what approach they need to take to take ownership of their success. So the Black Nurse Collaborative really spawned from a place and a desire to create opportunities to uplift each other those of us in the profession, to also look and reach back and create, and create pipelines and opportunities for other nurses like us. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha, from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. A Florida jury convicts a black man of du the DUI even after body cam video shows a white police officer planting evidence. Leon County Judge Jason Jones sentenced Calvin Riley to 10 days in jail and six months of probation for the May 2023 arrest. This case received a national spotlight just days ahead of the start of the trial because uh, media outlet uh, uh, Our Tallahassee posted an edited clip of the arresting officer's body camera footage. The footage shows, in part, an officer picking up a bottle from Riley's car during the incident, pouring out the contents and placing the bottle back inside the vehicle. After the video garnered thousands of views and reaction last week, the Tallahassee Police Department denies any misconduct allegations. So I, I'm, I'm still sort of confused uh, by this here. I'm going to bring in my panel right now uh, to chat about this. Uh, glad to have them with us today uh, because uh, it, it is uh, it's still it's quite confusing. And, and when you start talking about uh, these type uh, of stories and this judge's decision, I'm still trying to understand that the alcohol was in the car and then now she empties the car and then places it back. Gavin Reynolds, contributor with The Root and former speechwriter for Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, also, uh, he joins us now from New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Tyler McMillan, social justice leader, former national director, youth and college of the National Action Network. Derek L. Jackson, Georgia State Representative, District uh, 68 out of Atlanta. You know what, I, I, I would say, uh, Derek, if I'm the police department, um, I'm putting that putting an officer on desk duty where they can get much better training because I, I still don't understand once she pulled him over suggesting that she smelled marijuana. I, I, I guess I'm still confused how you can smell marijuana with a moving car. Uh, but then all of a sudden it turns into a DUI and she pours the alcohol out. Uh, so I'm, again, uh, this whole case has, um, has been confusing. You know, Roland, um, 
it is often uh, these types of scenarios that we constantly see, especially as it relates to black men, how uh, police officers uh, violate uh, their rights. I mean, when you go as far as planting evidence, so put training aside for a second, I think this is more about the behavior that we constantly see. This is a behavior where uh, those who think that it's okay to criminalize citizens before there are even charged, before, as you stated, how can you smell marijuana? Um, what, what kind of sense do you have? That's the reason why we have uh, canines to do that kind of work. Uh, our sensitivity of our nose do not qualify a person to be able, in the court of law, saying, well, I smell marijuana, um, I saw this uh, empty uh, bottle of, of liquor, and I suspect that this person should be charged. The judge, uh, which is even more confusing, with this amount of evidence uh, from the body cam uh, video footage, clearly should make uh, the right call on this. But we tend to not see this because when it comes down to law enforcement, uh, and, and it's interesting that we continue to talk about immunity, uh, this immunity uh, that's typically garnered to law enforcement officers uh, tend to create this behavior, this mindset that we constantly see in these types of scenarios. It goes well beyond training, well before training, because if this uh, brother uh, was European or someone other than black, then the outcome uh, of this scenario will be very, very different. Um, and again, uh, I'm sure it's 10 days uh, given, but the reality is the actions of this officer should be questioned by folks all across the country. Absolutely. And, you know, ordinarily in situations like this where we have body cam footage, you know, we've seen the ways in which, thankfully, that footage sheds much needed light on the circumstances that actually transpired and actually end up making it such that, you know, the, the inevitable black man who's in this situation can get some sort of justice in that situation. But yet and still, here we have this body cam footage and, you know, this black man is still you know, receive this outcome, you know, that he has. And we see this happen time and time again, just in the cases where we do have body cam footage and it does make the news, but how many other instances, you know, have we seen this occur or have we not, not seen this occur when we don't have that body cam footage, we don't have that evidence? You know, in those cases, you know, justice is far from served for those police officers who carry out this malfeasance. Um, and we have to remember, too, that in so many instances, right, when black men in these situations like this gentleman here get you know this sort of stain on their on their criminal record this can also have ramifications for their ability to ability to vote and participate in our democratic processes so it's important that we keep that in mind it's important the last thing i'll say too is that again and i beat the drum on this time and time again in this election season we know there's a lot at stake at the presidential level but there's so much at stake at the state and local levels too when we talk about who are the judges who are deciding these cases who are the sheriffs and police chiefs who are going to be you know leading these police departments who are the mayors, right, who we're voting for, who are going to appoint, you know, those local law enforcement leaders? We have to understand that when we talk about our democracy, our democracy requires participation from each and every one of us at every single level. And that can be the difference between, you know, these situations happening or not, or when they happen, ensuring that these police officers get desk duty and not another ride around the block. Tyler? Yeah, I, I will echo the, the same words as... Uh, my panelists before I went uh, going to see deeper, but I, I think, you know, my role as youth director, I had opportunities to work with a lot of families and victims that, that failed to police violence. And I think, you know, this is just a, you know, I, I think, would think that he came out safe, but I think this outcome is yet another failure on the U.S. Department of Justice. I, and I echo the same thing that, you know, we saw the video, the proof was in the body camera footage. Um, but I think that, that you know, adds on to the lack of trust that's in within, within the community. And uh, the question is, what else has this department been hiding? Uh, I think there should be a review of every DUI that this officer has conducted. And I, I think there should be a federal investigation into the Tallah Tallahassee uh, Police Department. All right, then we'll certainly we'll see what happens there. All right, we'll go to this next story here. And so uh, we all know Donald Trump only gives a damn about rich people. 
but listen to this racist comment uh, that he actually makes. And, and remember, he, he did the exact same thing uh, when, uh, he, when he was uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And, and I keep trying to explain to people, Donald Trump has one desire. He wants white immigrants in this country. He does not want any people of color. Watch this. Great honor that you're here. It's going to be a very spectacular evening, and people are just wanting change. The rich people want it. Poor people want it. Everybody wants change. Our country is really doing poorly. We're a laughing stock all over the world, and we're going to get that change very quickly. And this has been some... Uh, incredible evening before it even starts because people they wanted to contribute to a cause of making America great again and that's what's happened we're going to make America great again everyone knows it the election's going to be in now a little more than six months and it's going to be the most important I believe election we've ever had I think it's going to go down as the most important date in the history of our country that's November 5th will be the most important date in the history of our country, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Did you talk to Garcia's family, President Trump? Now that was uh, part of the, you know, the, the BS uh, comments that he made. Uh, but again, he, he's talked about immigrants before and and what he desires uh, and how he, where he said. I'm going to find the clip for a second where he wants people from nice countries. Uh, like Switzerland and countries along those lines. Uh, that's a tale. That, that, that's a tale there. Uh, I'm going to see if I can actually find that part right there. Just uh, give me a second. Uh, let's see if I can find it right here. Uh, let's see here. I think maybe do I have it right here. Possibly. Actually, I'm going to find a clip in a second. But he says, uh, Gavin, nice countries. Switzerland, countries along those lines. He does not want black people. And if you're, if you're an African immigrant, if you are Latino, I don't know what the hell you're thinking. He don't, he don't want y'all in this country. No, absolutely not. And I know we're going to talk about Haiti a little bit later tonight, but he had those famous comments where he referred to, you know, countries like Haiti as shithole countries. Donald Trump made it explicitly and abundantly clear, look, I'm a proud son of immigrants. My parents immigrated here from the beautiful country of Jamaica. I don't even know if he would want people coming in from Jamaica these days. Um, so when we hear Donald Trump make these comments, when we hear him talking about how he believes that immigrants are poisoning the blood, he's not talking about people coming in from Europe. We know that's a fact. He's talking about people from those shithole countries, as he's termed them, and he wants our immigration system. He wants our whole country to look a very certain kind of way. And we best believe that if we let him anywhere near the Oval Office again, he's going to put in place the policies. He's going to put in place the procedures. He's going to work through Congress to enact the laws that will fundamentally reshape and redesign our immigration system and our country in his image. Um, so this is the New York Times reported um, this, Tyler. Uh, and during the fundraiser, this is what he said. He, he appeared to refer to an episode during his presidency when he drew significant criticism after an Oval Office meeting with federal lawmakers about immigration during which he described Haiti and some nations in Africa as shithole countries compared to places with places like Norway. And when I said, you know, why can't we allow people to come in from nice countries? I'm trying to be nice, uh, Trump said at the dinner, to chuckles from the crowd. Nice countries, you know, like Denmark, Switzerland. Do we have any people coming in from Denmark? How about Switzerland? How about Norway? He continued. And, you know, they took that as a very terrible comment, but I felt it was fine. He went on to say that there were people coming from Yemen where they're blowing each other up all over the place. He's, he's literally saying, dang, can we not get more white people here? Literally, I think this is no surprise to the agenda. Uh, we talk about white supremacy and the suppression of black and brown folks in this country. And I think even as I hear his his slogan, this make America great again, I don't understand the peak in America's America where it had this such greatness. But if if we were to say that we have reached this progression of greatness, it was the fact that it was African slaves that were drug here by force that make America great. It is the folks who crossed the Rio Grande who make America great. It is the Native Americans that are that have have been in this country who make America great. It is the immigrants who come from these countries from across the world who build the fabrics of what this nation is. And if we are to be a nation that that talks about our diversity, that talks about uh, the the 
the the melting pot that we are in the, and in that uh, it is, it is those immigrants who 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 cross who cross those rivers and and, and comes and come over who build the fabric of our nation and and it's, and it's sad and sickening and not surprising uh, that the former president um, continues to, to echo those words out of his mouth. Uh, Derek, if you're black and brown, what he's saying is, Frank, I don't want y'all in the country. So I'm sorry, if you're black and brown, you got to be an idiot to even consider voting for Donald Trump. You know, Roland, we don't even have to imagine what he would do if he got back into the Oval Office, right? I mean, how he attacked uh, Baltimore, how he attacked uh, Atlanta, uh, predominantly black metropolitan areas. Uh, this man uh, said out of his own mouth uh, his true feelings, his true thoughts. And so what we have to do this time around, and I appreciate uh, your show in particular, because we're calling them out. We can't let folks off the hook and just simply try to downplay what he says when the camera is rolling. No, he didn't really mean that. It's a Freudian slip, et cetera, et cetera. No, he means what he said. And just like what he did, well, he attempted to do with the Central Park Five that, that are now exonerated five, the same thing that he did when he was the landlord of an apartment, putting a little C by every application uh, where it was, you know, families of color. Uh, this man has a long history, Roland, of racism, bigotry, and hatred, and we have to call it out. Absolutely. All right, folks, hold tight one second. When we come back, we're going to chat with Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton. You know, these racists continue their attack on DEI in every aspect. Now they're trying to attack what's happening in medical schools, and she says this could have devastating consequences for the medical industry. I will chat with her after this short break. Don't forget, support us what we do. Uh, you can join the Black, the Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash out, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Next, on The Black Table, with me, Greg Carr, a conversation with Professor Toyin Falola, a man described by many as an African intellectual legend. He is without a doubt the most important and prolific writer, thinker, teacher, and servant of African studies in the modern world. And then today, we have George Floyd, the Black Lives Matters, and the reemergence of radical black Talks. We're honored to welcome him to a very special, can't miss episode of The Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hello, I'm Jamia Pugh. I am from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, just an hour right outside of Philadelphia. My name is Jasmine Pugh. I'm also from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. You are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay right here. Oh, DEI, DEI, DEI. The right has been constantly attacking DEI programs, which is their latest attack on black folks. It was CRT, it's affirmative action, it's quotas, it's diversity. I mean, it goes on and on and on, and it, frankly, it's all anti-black. They're also bolstered by the Supreme Court's decision banning affirmative action in colleges and universities, and they've been using that to go after everything, which I told y'all this stuff was coming down. I've been talking about since 2009, wrote about it in my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. And so now what you have is a, an attack on medical schools. You've been hearing the language. Oh, my goodness. Uh, conservatives like Dave Rubin, R Rubin people are going to be dying uh, because we're letting these unqualified folks, these DEI hires in. Hmm. Do, do they say anything about when people uh, have been injured or died 
at the hands of white doctors? No, I don't think so. Well, Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton, of course, University of Virginia anesthesiologist, she is, she looked fired up. So she was posting some comments over the weekend. She sent me a text. She was like, bro, I got to come on. I was like, Ebony, you're always welcome on the show. So, Doc, glad to have you. It's been a while since we've had you on. Glad to see you. So, um, you have not been happy with these folks. Take it away. Right. I mean, it, it's one of these things. It's the same tired, um, how do you say, rhetoric that we've had for generations of where it is a blame black people for the lack of progression of our individual selves that racists seem to um, center on. And if we really don't look at, you know, who benefits from DEI efforts in the first place, it's been the same thing since the women's suffrage back in the 1920s. The greatest benefactor of any type of affirmative action has always been and will continue to be white women. But in this discussion of who we should limit and keep out of the, the halls of the hospital, we're continuously pointing the finger at black people as if we're overwhelming the system in the first place. In fact, if you look at it, of all physicians, black women, we only make up 2%, 2% of the doctors. So these racist people that are screaming out, limit the DEI, they are literally punching air because who are you talking about that's taking your spot? Also, when we talk about this idea of DEI, go to my iPad. I mean, look, it's a part of the healthcare industry. Uh, this is from USA Today within medical schools. DEI is a broadly accepted part of basic training for quality care. We cannot deny the reality of, frankly, medical apartheid, uh, how black folks have been treated separately uh, from others. And so it's important to teach these things to get non-minority doctors to understand that you cannot bring your, frankly, your biases to the table when you are assessing patients. We know when it came to even, uh, I mean, early on, racism actually help black people in the sense of the opioid crisis because early on doctors were not prescribing black folks the powerful opioids because they said, oh, they must be here trying to get their fix in. So they were prescribing Tylenol, what they were giving the white folks, uh, all the other different drugs. And so they start dropping dead left and right. I remember I gave a speech and I said, wow, the one time racism actually helped black people for a while. Right. And, you know, we can talk about the problem um, that black people face, and then we can also talk about the impact that diversity has had on the medical field in general. The problem black people face, for one, we're, we're nearly twice as likely to die from any kind of preventable heart disease, preventable heart disease. If you're between the ages of 45 and 54 years old and you're black, you're three times more likely to die from a stroke than if you're white. We can talk about cervical cancer and breast cancer and how black women are two times more likely to die from cervical cancer. We saw Jessica Pettiway, 36 years old. Life is over, right, from misdiagnosis from cervical cancer. We can talk about breast cancer and the fact that black women have higher death rates in every single state of the United States of America. We can talk about prostate cancer and black men being twice as likely to die from prostate cancer than if they were white. And Dr. Martin Luther King's youngest son, 62 years old, just died from prostate cancer. So we can talk about all these, these devastating things. And we can also talk about the benefit of why that means that we need more black people in the medical field. For instance, if we're looking at infant mortality, right? We know that one in every 90 black children, one in 90, will die before their first birthday. We bury them. But if you are a black mother in a Florida study of 1.8 million births, if you are a black mother and you had a black daughter or doctor, your child's likelihood of dying was cut in half. That, that is huge in itself. And then there was other studies looking at 16,000 or 1,600, sorry, um, counties that showed that if you had an increase in just 10% of black physicians present, that you would increase mortality or your, your, your length of life by at least 30 days. These are the things that we are not talking about, of how black people and black doctors help to keep black people alive. And it's not just about race. Again, we're looking at the greatest benefactors of the DEI movement. It has been women in totality, right? But if you look at women in the surgical field, there was a study looking at over 1.5 million um, cases. And what they saw was that if you had women taking care of patients instead of men, 32,000 people would be alive at the end of the year. 
in addition to what we already have, right? And then our surgical patients, it showed that of a million cases, if you had a female surgeon, you were 25% less likely to die than if you had a male surgeon. So when we have these you know, opponents come in and say we should limit DEI and we should keep the underrepresented minorities out of medicine, what they are literally translating that to is that we can increase death and morbidity and mortality because we know those people and that diversity helps to keep people alive and reduce complications. Uh, and you have a member of Congress uh, who has been talking about this, and he's supposed to still address uh, a, a health organization, uh, and you're not too happy about that. At all. That's Dr. Murphy. First of all, Dr. Murphy is a urologist, and if we look in 2018, they showed that of the 11,000 urologists that are around, right, that only 262 were black, 11,000 and 262. Again, these people are punching air because who are you mad about that's taking your seat? And Dr. Murphy, for instance, I think he, he entered in medical school in 1980, 85. Um, we have to remember Tuskegee experiment didn't end until 1972. So there were not a lot of black people in your medical school class anyway. That tells you how long we still have a lag in catching up to the numbers that we deserve, because we should be a reflection of the population that we serve, because we are public servants, we are medical providers. Uh, questions from the panel, let's see here. Uh, Tyler, you're first. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would echo your words. I think, thank you for your, your leadership on this. And I think, you know, it's shocking, but it's not, you know, uh, it's shocking to see with with it, all the rhetoric that we've, we've been seeing with DEI has been just ongoing. And I think, as you mentioned before, diversity amongst physicians leads to better health outcomes for patients, and it leads to health equity and closes disparities. Uh, what can folks do to, to com like to combat this? We, you know, we see it at the in Congress as more of a message bill, but this could be a trickle down effect uh, into states states across the country. What can folks do to ensure uh, that they're their schools and communities are safe. Right, I, I think one thing that we can do is we literally can say, hey, we are black people and we're paying our taxes that go to fund these public, these, these federally backed um, health insurance policies, Medicaid, Medicare. And if we know that our outcomes are better when we have physicians that look like us, that talk like us, whether that's our language, uh, uh, our native tongue, if they have our same religion, right? If they have our same sexual orientation, if they have our same gender, if they have our same race, if we know that they have better outcomes and that I am more likely to be alive, then this needs to be a federal policy and not one of these things where we're deeming, um, you know, the, the public's feelings of which most of these people don't even have a medical degree to begin with. They have not taken the MCAT to begin with. And they're yet telling people who are qualified and who are not qualified to be in those positions. And so I think we need to start doing that. We need to start tying policies um, related to whether or not this is a civil rights issue. If we are dying more, shouldn't more be done to keep us alive? We are tax paying citizens. We are citizens at, at large. Shouldn't there be something that looks at and holds accountable the institutions that we are turning our lives over to? If we look at the numbers for the hospital, for the department, down to the individual provider, and it is showing that you have a racial health disparity, and you're not showing how you are tackling those racial health disparities, then you should not be afforded federally backed dollars. That just does not make sense. Are you, are you actually trying to say the pro-life people actually care about black lives? <laughs> right. Derek, right. your question. Dr. Hilton, yeah. I really appreciate your, your work in this area. Um, so mine's is sort of twofold because we got the systemic challenges that we're dealing with here in Georgia. I'm right in Atlanta, where 82 counties out of 159 counties do not have an OBGYN. 61 counties out of 159 do not have a pediatrician. So how do we combat the structural challenges? But then there's a disinformation. As you were breaking it down, the facts, Georgia, depending on which ranking you look at, we're number 47, 48, or 49 when it comes down to uh, maternal and infant mortality. Uh, 169 women died just simply trying to bring you know life into this world. Uh, in Georgia, 776 children die, just simply try to become part of our population. And so how do we combat 
disinformation and misinformation when we are trying to give facts in our Georgia General Assembly down here and at the same time in the black community build trust because we noticed during COVID, uh, because of the misinformation and disinformation, um, that trust factor really uh, plays an impact on the things that we could and could not do during COVID. Right, you know, and you bring up great points. One access, and then the, the misinformation or, or the the stigma that's placed on Black people too. That the reason why we don't engage in medical conversations is because of, of one, just simply mistrust, and or for two, that we don't want to be compliant with recommendations. But I think what we see, if we particularly look at COVID. Once black people were actually allowed to get the vaccine, because we do have to remember there was a phase out process of when the vaccines were allowed to the public, right? And in the very first time, it was for medical providers, of which only 16% of, of um, medical providers are black. And that's including nurses, that's including nurses tech on down, right? Um, and then it went to a long age group and it said, well, if you're 75 and older, um, of which we know that of all Americans, 65 and older, only 9% are black. So automatically they wrote us off as being able to be available to have the, um, are eligible to have the vaccine in the first place. It really wasn't until the summertime of 2021 that black people in large were able to get vaccinated unless those persons had severe heart disease, diabetes, had some form of cancer. Basically, you had to enter into 2020 with at least one of your organs dead and are gone, or you had to be a doctor in order to get vaccinated if you were Black, largely in the United States of America. But what you bring up is a very good point, though, as far as listening to the voices of Black people and getting them the resources that they need. What we saw with COVID, in addition to the misinformation and the, the lack of access to vaccines, the two big hurdles that we had to go through, was that there were no hospitals within our communities. Literally, there were mobile vans behind the, the grocery store. There were in the parking lots of the barbershop and the church, um, in the, the, the church communion hall, right? Those are where we had to show up in order to get vaccinated. And when the COVID pandemic was quote unquote over, those mobile vans disappeared. There was not one brick laid to establish a new clinic within those um, neighborhoods and those communities that we knew were dying at five to six times the rate of other community members right down the street. And so what I again urge black people to do is we know that health is political, unfortunately. We can say, you know, health and politics are two separate things, but it absolutely is not. And in Georgia in particular, we see the power of the vote and what you can do when we turn out in numbers. And I know it's difficult because they try to disenfranchise us, but again, you pay tax dollars. So why is it that you're taking money out of my check every month that I could be using to feed my children, and yet my children don't have a pediatrician within their community? Why is that? Why is it with, with the development of telehealth, why is it that every single public school at this point doesn't have telehealth um, capabilities of where a pediatrician can dial in and view my child while they're still in school and one, reduce the likelihood or the need for me to get off of work, right? And also prescribe the medication so they can get treatment right then and there. Why, is, why are we not doing that? We have absolutely the means to do it, but in America, because of the people that are in place, in power, have never had the, the kind of the consequence of what the disparity looks like. They don't live check to check. They've never had an issue of, of availability of a provider because they're afforded one, right? Um, we have to look at that because it can, even with the best of persons, put a blinder up where you don't see the obstacle that everyday Americans are having to face. But when that blinding leads to the death of black people, where we are now dying at younger ages than two and three generations ago. That is now a problem that we have to reconcile with and America needs to do better. And Evan, the reality is when we look at, uh, I mean, the, the numbers are the numbers. I mean, I don't care what category. Um, it's not like, oh, we're doing great in any one particular area in the medical field. It, it, it's true. I mean, from again, if you look at the leading causes of death, 
12 of the 15 leading causes of death, black people have higher rates at younger ages. I mean, we can look at Chadwick Boseman, right? We can we can look at Dexter Scott King. We can look at Jessica Pettyway. We can look at near deaths too, though. We can look at Serena Williams. We can look at Beyonce mm -hmm. and their complications with pregnancy. It's not only the ones of us who die that is an issue. That's a major issue. But it's also the ones of us that are living with the consequences of the near misses. And again, when we're living in the United States of America, where we're able to, to donate money to all these other countries, right? And we can, we're able to, as you were saying in your, your previous segment, point at other countries and call them shithole countries. But we don't take a second to look within and wonder why we still don't have clean water in Flint, Michigan. And that was back in 2014. While we still have not all the power in, in Puerto Rico, right? How are we able to have these issues where we turn a blind eye to the to the best most vulnerable populations when again these are tax paying citizens and i'm not saying that taxes are everything but what i do know is that it takes money to run these programs and we with every single cent that comes out of your check are funding these programs we're funding these hospitals and therefore they need to serve us and that's how we start to really think about the i feel we should start to think about the black lives matter movement because like Dr. Martin Luther King said, of all forms of inequality, it's injustice in health that's the most shocking and most inhumane. We lose far more people at the hands of medicine and the lack of resources and the misdiagnosis that happened and, and the, the lack of accountability when things go wrong within our community than we would ever do with the police system. But yet the, the call for reform is simply not there in the, in the voice and the strength that it is when we see the happenings of Philando Castile and, and George Floyd and Sandra Bland, things that definitely need spotlighting. But Jessica Pettyway, she also deserves to be spotlighted. Yep, absolutely. And so you have been sounding the alarm, so we appreciate it. And of course, as I said, you're welcome anytime. But I can't let you go yet, because I was on social media uh, yesterday, and I came across this tweet right here. Um, City girls, y'all had your run, but 2024 is for us hashtag country girls. First, Beyonce and Cowboy Carter goes number one, and now South Carolina Gamecocks go number one. Let's go. So uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and gloat for the country girls right now. T I see Tyler. Tyler, what's this? You got a, Tyler, you got the orange, what? Uh, you an Astros fan, Tyler? I, I, I've just got my my uh, my cowboy Carter on, you know, celebrating the Beyonce. So. Okay, all right then. Uh, well, uh, well, Ebony, uh, you, you 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 and your fellow country girls feeling yourselves, huh? I mean, as we should. I mean, again, we have the number one album out. Um, this is global. It's not within just within the United States of America. And then I'm not sure if you all saw, but the game cost did shut it down. And that is a very young team, so we're not going anywhere. Um, I am from Little Africa, South Carolina. Please look us up. So, yeah, I, I was very much um, not only clapping, right. but I felt like I was in the stands. Yes. That was uh, Gavin, you trying to say something? Well, I was going to say I didn't get to ask my question, Roland. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I thought I'd uh, go ahead. What's your question for uh, Ebony? You're good. Dr. Hilton, thanks for joining us. I wanted to just thank you for all that you're doing, the service you're providing to your community, the platform, uh, how you're using your platform. I mean, I just, I just give you a follow on Twitter. I'm excited to stay engaged. Um, and I want to thank you on behalf of all the, the young future black uh, doctors who are out there who are watching you do what you do uh, and, and feel inspired uh, by it. Folks like my little sister, who is about to start dental school, I'm very proud of her. Um, but I wanted to ask you, taking a step back and thinking about how we can build the pipeline of black doctors um, in medicine. I know from friends of mine who are in the field, or like I said, my little sister, that there are a lot of barriers, right, that stand in the way of, of, uh, of students uh, making it to medical school. Academic barriers, obviously, but also some financial barriers, you know, whether it comes to you know, the MCAT test prep or paying to actually take the MCAT or paying for your application fees, your secondary fees. Um, how can we remove some of these barriers? Are there policies? Should the medical schools be doing more? Are there scholarships out there for students who might be listening? Uh, just want to get your take on how we can make, how we can, how we can reduce these financial barriers that stand in the way of so many of our young, potentially future doctors, you know, making that crossover into medical school. 
you know, that's a great question. And congratulations to your sister. Um, you know, it's one of those things I too, I didn't come from a medical family. My parents, they didn't graduate from high school. I mean, it, it really was a learned process of how do I even apply for this, this, and this? What do you mean there's an MCAT? Um, but I was very fortunate to have people placed in my path that when I had a question um, that I could go to them and say, can you just show me how? Because I know I'm more than capable. And that's the thing. Of all the degrees that you see behind me, um, truly my greatest degree is my lived life experience because that can't be taught in a book. And it will make you, for those young people who are, who are watching me thinking, you know, I don't know what it takes to be a doctor. Because you've lived it, you absolutely then there under, therefore understand what are the obstacles that are placed in the way of persons trying to get and, and receive access to medicine. And therefore you are exactly who we need to be there. So as far as what you can do to get um, medical resources and financial resources, I actually, this was probably about 10 years ago at this point, I made a YouTube video explaining just what you should do if you're a pre-med student, how do you get your letters of recommendation? What are some research projects you can do? How do you strengthen your application? What are some summer undergraduate research programs that are offered at all these different institutions? And also, where are some free MCAT prep programs? It's on um, my YouTube channel, of which, again, I only have like two videos. Do not look at it for that, because that's not what it was for. <laughs> but anyway, ah, ah, ah. it was um, EJ Hilton, um, I think is my, at Gmail. I don't know. I don't do YouTube. But the point <laughs> being, I will try to get it um, to uh, to Roland so he can post it. But underneath that video, in the caption, you can see all these links of where you can go and get these resources. Because I do believe w there are so many brilliant Black children that are in these communities that are oftentimes overlooked because we're Title I, right? That was me getting free lunch in, in elementary school. I, I lived that life. And because of that, that's why I know that there's no hospital within those communities because there's still no hospital within my community that I grew up. And that's why I am so vocal when I speak out to say that those people, my family, their, their lives matter. And I can see the difference in the resources that are afforded to me now that I live in, in a higher income neighborhood than what I was when I was a child who was just as brilliant, just as just as capable, just as eager to contribute to my community and to my country, but I wasn't giving the, the access, um, right? I had to go and actively try and be on this treadmill proving to everyone on and on from every great level that yes, I can do this. And what it led to was me getting three degrees in four years while working two jobs, graduating with honors, going on to medical school, graduated top of my class, and then going on to be the first at every single institution I've worked at so far, the first and only black person to work at that institution in my mm -hmm. in my specialty. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be that way. I am proud to say that since I've worked at those institutions, they've at least tripled the number, which means only mm -hmm. three, but still, but still being very vocal that it is not right that we continue to allow for the exclusion of persons who who are beneficial, not, not just because they're there, but they literally take better care, they reduce the morbidity, they redu reduce the mortality, meaning they reduce the complications and the likelihood that patients die. That's why we are needed. Well, uh, look, y'all, I tried during COVID to get uh, Ebony to do more videos, and she and her uh, partners uh, with their uh, health practice in South Carolina, they do some videos. I tried, y'all. I tried. So uh, maybe maybe we'll try uh, uh, Ebony Jade Hilton YouTube 2.0 uh, in 2024. Right. right. We'll, 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 we'll have to bring you to, uh, to video boot camp. All right. <laughs> Always good to see you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. All right. Take care. All right, folks. Got to go to a break. We come back more. We'll talk about the Gamecocks going undefeated. Uh, and you got to love black people. Wait till I show you this video of Don Staley and her uh, speech after winning the championship. Uh, as only black people could do it. <laughs> yeah. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, 
and if re-elected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets, creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out. You know, right. we make we make you know lemons out of lemonade. But there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out. Clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching the band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We You're said, like, no, we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hello, I'm Marissa Mitchell, a news anchor at Fox 5 DC. Hey, what's up? It's Sammy Roman, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back. Haiti should have a new president sworn in on February 7, 2026. That's the plan. Haitian leaders have finalized for a proposed transition government. A transitional government will work for 22 months to restore order to the gameplay capital of Port-au-Prince and prepare for two-year elections. The nine-member ruling council, comprised of seven voting members and two non-voting observers, was named by a cross-section of political parties and civil society organizations. The plan ends nearly a month of negotiations to determine a path for selecting a new prime minister to replace outgoing leader Ariel Henry, the prime minister who resigned. The gains continue to paralyze the country. Haiti's National Police Agency says that it has recovered a hijacked cargo ship laden with um, rights following a gun battle with gangs that lasted more than five hours. The gangs reportedly kidnapped everyone aboard the ship and stole some 10,000 sacks of rice out of the 60,000 sacks it was carrying. The country is on the verge of starvation as more people are going hungry as the Caribbean nation struggles to survive with no stable government and the increase in deadly gang violence. The reality here, um, Derek, is that you've got to have security. You've got to be able to control what's happening. You have to give people any hope whatsoever. You cannot have gangs in complete control uh, of, the nation, of the, the nation's capital. You know, the last time Ro <coughs> I was on your show, and here we are a couple weeks later, um, the trajectory for Haiti is going in the wrong direction. I really do believe that the United States can play a larger role. Uh, despite the history between Haiti and the United States, uh, put that aside. But when you had this kind of chaos, conflict, and confusion, when you have street-level gangs who are basically hijacking um, produce and, and bags of rice, as you mentioned, uh, we, we just, as the United States, cannot stand by. Um, we don't do it for European countries. Um, we should not do it for Haiti. Uh, and I say, so we got to step up and do more um, and, and not uh, just simply just watch this uh, chaos and this conflict and this confusion to continue to run rapid uh, in Haiti. 
You know, it is um, a, a whole lot going on, Gavin, and uh, retired General Russell Honore has not been happy with the Biden-Harris administration. He said, he says they need to be far more vocal than they have been on this. He said, you look, we're talking about Ukraine, talking about Israel. He said, but no mention at all from uh, the president or the vice president of what's happening in Haiti. I think it's important that the president and the vice president definitely uh, say more on this issue. We know Secretary Blinken has been very active in trying to help negotiate um, peace. Uh, in this situation. Uh, so I look forward to the administration continuing to, you know, build on the work that they've been doing with CARICOM, you know, to arrive at some stability um, in this situation. Because, I mean, look, we got a lot of problems here in the U.S. that so we take for granted that we don't have to worry about the level of turmoil and chaos and, and violence that we're seeing, you know, play out um, in, in Haiti right now. Because the bottom line is this, the people of Haiti deserve, you know, way better than this. Uh, and I think the president and vice president uh, certainly understand this. The vice president as our first, you know, Caribbean uh, vice president ever and the highest ranking certainly that we've ever had, I think is acutely aware of the needs of, of the Caribbean. She's met with a number of Caribbean leaders, um, both here in the U.S. and in the Caribbean. And so I do believe that she and also the president who is, you know, certainly very well versed in foreign affairs during his long career, uh, you know, in government. I think they're both very well aware that the U.S. certainly has a big role um, to play. I think France certainly needs to be doing a whole lot more as well, especially given the history, you know, between France uh, and Haiti. Look, I mean, I'm very concerned. You know, I mentioned it a few minutes ago being a you know, son of Jamaican immigrants. I was in Jamaica not too long ago and I was asking you know, someone uh, who I met down there, if he was concerned that some of what we've seen happen uh, in Haiti as it pertains to the gang violence, which Jamaica is seeing a spike in, you know, might have spillover effects to countries like Jamaica and elsewhere in the Caribbean. And he certainly was very, you know, nervous and anxious about that. And a big reason why is because of the flow of, of guns, right, between countries like the U.S., and uh, Jamaica, Haiti, and other Caribbean nations. So I think it's really important that, you know, leaders of these various nations, you know, recognize the need to clamp down on the illegal flow of guns because that flow is really helping to uh, support the gang violence and gang activity that we're seeing, you know, in countries like Haiti. And so I do believe that the president and vice president, Secretary Blinken, you know, are engaged on this issue. They recognize how important it is. And I look forward to them continuing to build on that work, doing even more to hopefully get to a situation as they've done so far to help uh, bring about some peace, you know, that they can actually, you know, help get that done. And we can see some stability in government in Haiti for the benefit of the people. Talek? Yeah, I would echo the echo the same words. I was on on the show when General was on, and I echo those uh, the hundreds of thousands of folks who are displaced by the, uh, gang violence. And I think it's important that the administration, the president, and vice president, uh, speak up. I think it's important um, in in securing the streets again and in, in, in the United States. However, they can do in their support. I think we must pay attention to what's happening in in these black. Uh, these black countries, you know, as what's happening in Sudan and the Congo, what's happening in Haiti should not be a blind eye to what's happening across across the world. And I think it's important that we provide resources, that we support those who are seeking asylum to come to this country, that we are stopping deportations from, from going back, uh, that we are offering support, uh, because at the end of the day, there are, you know, there are children and, and, and uh, you know, helpless people who, who need our help and support. Um, and it's crucial that this uh, administration address um, the need of the Haitian people, and, and and that and that the administration also listens to trusted voices um, and uh, and media outlets, uh, and that the uh, that the president's advisors take into account of what Haitian Americans uh, are saying uh, that this that the response should be. Absolutely, and so hopefully uh, those things are going to get done. All right, folks, going to go to a quick break. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause 
too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Everybody, I'm Kim Coles. Hey, I'm Dolly Simpson. Yo, it's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, uh, Janiah Adair has been missing from Memphis, Tennessee since February 13th. The 15-year-old is 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighs 114 pounds, and has black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Janiah Adair is urged to call the Memphis Police Department at 901-545-2677, 901-545-2677. All right, folks, everybody all around the world was talking about the eclipse today, uh, depending upon where you were located uh, in the country. Uh, you had uh, a lot of hilarious videos, people out uh, trying to figure out what to do. We live streamed uh, a, a feed, NASA, uh, man, they had a feed. Their feed was absolutely packed on YouTube. At one point, I checked some 700,000 people uh, was on the uh, on, on the NASA uh, live feed, and uh, it was actually pretty cool uh, seeing uh, all of the, uh, they, they were bouncing around the country uh, talking to a variety of people who were gathered uh, as well. So it was uh, it was pretty cool. So uh, before I, I, now, depend upon where you were, uh, you didn't see much of it. Uh, some other places, uh, they actually, uh, had a lot, uh, and let me tell you, let me tell you how significant uh, NASA's uh, YouTube channel was. I just checked; they had three hours and nine minutes of coverage uh, on their official broadcast. Uh, go ahead to show us. So this is this is of course this is what uh, they started with. I'm just going to advance it a little bit here, and they had a total of 11 million views over those three hours on NASA's coverage. Uh, pretty cool there. So, um, okay, uh, Tylik, uh, were you Eclipse-focused today? You know what, Mar you know what, Roland? I went to all the stores and could not find glasses, but I saw your trick on Instagram, and I, uh, you know, flip my, uh, <laughs> my camera. <laughs> it's a see, see, you always, see, you always got to... You know, you do, you, folks, y'all got to understand, you got to do your research. So I came across this story. I came across this story. It was from 2017. Uh, and they, they, what I did was I typed in uh, uh, Eclipse and iPhone. Uh, and a story came up in 2017 that said, hey, no big deal. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have um, uh, the sunglasses, uh, the trick was for you to... Put your, put your camera uh, on uh, selfie mode, and then, uh, again, don't stare at the camera, but actually take a photo of the eclipse, and then uh, you would be able to uh, actually 
see exactly what was taking place. And so again, uh, depend, depending upon where you are, where you were in the country, uh, you know, it, it showed it showed different things. Uh, I'm gonna pull up uh, some photos in a second right here uh, of what happened, what, what, what it was like for me where I was uh, in Northern Virginia. Uh, I was uh, tick checking out a uh, different time. So uh, this here was uh, one of the photos. Uh, this was another photo. Uh, you see, I zoom in right here. Uh, and so it wasn't uh, that great or dramatic, but it's all good. You, had, uh, you just had different uh, opportunities there. Uh, how about you, Gavin? Yeah, I took in the eclipse today. I certainly hope uh, Donald Trump didn't stare directly in it again. <laughs> Four eyes. <laughs> uh, but I had fun. I had fun out there. I had my glasses on. Uh, and uh, let's not let this moment pass without, you know, calling for, uh, you know, all young black folks out there who enjoyed looking up at the eclipse today to recognize that there is a career field out there, a number of career fields out there that, you know, they can spend their days looking up into space through telescopes. You know, we need more black astronomers and engineers and and astronauts. We actually have a black man, Victor Glover, a NASA engineer who's going to be going up to the International Space Station in the in the next SpaceX launch. And that's historic. That's really exciting. Um, NASA did this really cool, or some of the black NASA astronauts did a really cool campaign uh, recently. Not astronauts, but all sorts of uh, engineers, young black uh, engineers who work for NASA in a, in a number of capacities did a really cool campaign on social media showing some of their, you know, black, beautiful faces. And so, you know, let's not let today pass without, you know, putting in a plug for, you know, mm -hmm. more programs out there that are exposing, you know, young black uh, students to careers in, in space. Uh, so, you know, I think today was a lot of fun, but uh, I think the sky is the limit, yep. you know, as, uh, as to what our people can do to uncover more and more knowledge about uh, space and our solar system. Go to my iPad. Let me shout out my homegirl, Courtney Robertson. Today is her birthday. She actually traveled to Niagara Falls on the Canadian side to experience the uh, eclipse. Uh, and so she sent me, she knows when she's going to shout out, but she sent me this video uh, from Niagara Falls, which I, I thought was pretty cool. Uh, Derek, how about you? You know, Roland, um, I did not get a chance to participate in this. What the hell were you doing? Listen, because <laughs> we had another eclipse here in Atlanta, Roland. Today, 50 years ago, is when Hank Aaron eclipsed Babe Ruth Rucker and hit 715 homers. That was the eclipse we were participating here in the ATL because 50 years ago, a man named Hammer and Hank Aaron surpassed, eclipse. You like how I did that? Eclipse, Babe Ruth's record. So was there a program or something that was uh, going on today? Oh, yes. There, you know, I mean, there were several events um, that was happening. Um, but, you know, here as the largest black caucus, uh, we certainly celebrated and recognized uh, Hammer and Mr. Hammer and uh, Hank Aaron uh, because, as you well know, not only did he eclipse uh, Babe Ruth Rucker, but he broke so many barriers back then. And then even after he retired from baseball, he continued to break records. He eclipsed records uh, in, in business as well. And so uh, that's the solar eclipse uh, that we were doing here in the ATL. Okay. All right, then. Hey, so. Uh, you like how I did that? You like how I did that? Yeah, that was that was that was a nice try. Go ahead, somebody. Go go ahead, someone. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, uh, he spoke about, uh, you know, Victor Glover. I must say, you know, with with the alphas on the, on the line, that Victor Glover is a man of sigma, astronaut. Shout him out. Okay, <laughs> that's that's cute, but you're late. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's cute, but you but you're late trying to get it in. Uh, and see, Derek, I'm always prepared uh, for anything. So uh, this is, of course, uh, from 2017 uh, when I was one of the uh, hand selected honorees uh, of Hank Aaron uh, for the Hank Aaron Courage Award. Uh, that was seven years ago, uh, and so this uh, was some video uh, that I shot in their new ballpark. Uh, that's the uh, whole display. That they have there uh, of Hank Aaron, including uh, 755 baseball bats representing each one of the home runs he hit in his career. So that's the statue, of course, uh, there showing his uh, powerful hands. 
Uh, and uh, fo so, folks, uh, if you all have not been to that stadium, uh, listen, doesn't matter if your team uh, plays there, uh, you, you still want to be able to take advantage uh, of that. So it was, uh, it was absolutely great uh, to, to, know, to know Henry. First of all, let me be real clear. Uh, he preferred Henry Aaron. Uh, and so he never really liked being called Hank Aaron and was shortened. Uh, and he would always say, uh, my man, um, uh, my man, uh, Brian, Howard Bryant wrote a book on Henry uh, Aaron. And anybody who, uh, he, he always knew who, who his friends were because they called him Henry. Everyone else called him Hank Aaron. Uh, and so that was always an interesting distinction uh, about him as well. So um, it, was, uh, it was great. Uh, to be there a few years ago uh, and to uh, to uh, to see him chat with him. So all around uh, a great day. Uh, and given you're absolutely right. I, it was I, I, one of the reasons why I love today, uh, because what it does is when you talk about the, the solar eclipse, I mean, it, it really does, I think, make a lot of people re go revert back to when they were children, because it is interesting how you know, Frank, it, it, it's so it's how how many people were excited about science in their younger days, and as they get older, it's yeah. like, oh my God, I don't want it. So all the different, I was watching this, all different videos and things on social media, how people were just preparing, uh, and then there were, I think, there were literally like eclipse parties and people who were hanging out and all sorts of different things that were going on. Definitely. I think days like today make science fun. And it's it's sad, right? Because like the more advanced you get in school, the subjects become harder and harder and harder. It's a lot easier to be like, nah, I don't really want to do that. But if you can get young people when they're young, if you can get them at an early age to love science, to, you know, to love math. It's really like once you hook them, you got them, right? And as the subjects get harder and harder, they have that innate, they have that love that they developed at a young age, and and that'll drive them through. So I really love days like today, you know, and other sorts of, uh, you know, when other sorts of events happen where, you know, all of us are glued to, you know, our TVs, our phones, something to do with science, and we just see how cool it is. So you know, I, I think kudos to those who, unlike me, I was a neurobio major in college, Roland, actually, and um, I do not work in that field, <laughs> but I did stick with my degree. I got that degree, um, but I credit my mom and my dad who, you know, really, you know, raised me to understand that science can be cool, right? That science can be fun. And I'm really so proud of my mom who, what she does now, she goes around Atlanta to different Title I schools and she brings hands-on science and engineering activities, you know, to schools that otherwise wouldn't have those. And, um, and I've seen a meaningful difference in some of those students she's worked with for years who get older and they're like, actually, actually, I might want to be an engineer. I might want to be a scientist. I might want to be a doctor. And so I think those sorts of things are so important, especially tying to the conversation we just had, um, you know, with the, with the doctor who joined us that, you know, we got we to gotta increase the number of black folks who are in these science and math and engineering fields. And, and days like today, hopefully, you know, we can hook, hook some of our kids and keep them on that path. All right, then. All right. Got to go to a break uh, and uh, see, Derek, here you go. Since, you know, you were sitting you were sitting here, you were sitting here talking this. Hold on one second. I had it up. Uh, give me one second. There we go. I got it back. Uh, and so this was from 2017. Uh, Henry Aaron, uh, the great uh, man himself. And so uh, I will be sure to, when I get off of the air, a lot of times people forget this. When I get up there, I'll be sure to call his widow, Billy, just to check on her, see how she's doing. All right, y'all, hold on one second. We come back. We're talking South Carolina Gamecocks, national champions, 38 and 0. Lots of love for Don Staley. Ooh, that's next as we continue to celebrate black excellence. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, people can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated, this goes for males and females, trust your gut. And then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step -step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network.
I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, Beyonce has always been country. We're talking to music, pop culture, and politics writer Taylor Crumpton about her new article on Beyonce's new country songs and how country music has always been part of Black culture. Since the release of Texas Hold'em in 16 Carriages, there has been a definition of what Black country music is and a definition of what white country music is. Mm. White country music historically has always won the awards, we've always got the certifications. Black country music has not. This is a conversation you don't want to miss. That's next on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. What's good, y'all? This is Doug E. Fresh, and you're watching my brother Roland Martin unfiltered as we go a little something like this. Hit it. It's real. All right, a lot of attention was on Caitlin Clark, but guess what? They completely overlooked the folks who eventually won the national champions championship, and that is in women's college basketball, the South Carolina Gamecocks, SCC, SCC. Uh, they uh, defeated. This is uh, uh, actually a video here, of course, the end of the game uh, when uh, they uh, won the title. Quite an emotional Don Staley as their team won. Here's a trophy presentation. 24 National Championship Trophy to Coach Don Staley and the South Carolina Gamecocks. Now, y'all know black people. Y'all know black people. We got to be a little extra. So uh, this brother on Instagram and uh, TikTok, well, just go ahead and play it. God give honor to the most high God for allowing us to be back at the same place in which we had sad tears. And I just want you to know that the God I serve, the God I serve, when he closes a door, he opens up a door that is, that's giving you unimaginable success. This is uncommon favor. Favor. Uncommon favor. Uncommon favor. So, so, all right. So, uh, the panel, y'all were a little fired up there, Tyler. I'm look, I'm look, almost caught the Holy Ghost over here watching that video. It's, some, it's, it's something. It's something that an organ does to the people. <laughs> Derek? It's like a slump and clap. <laughs> I was about to pass the plate. Uh, you know, here's the thing, though, uh, Roland. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about our culture. 
That's the beautiful thing about our culture. It's authentic. It's real. It's genuine. Um, we realize the same God that served our ancestors is the same God that we serve today. And so we realize we cannot do this on our own. You and Listen, Roland, I, I've been uh, to those places uh, during the general convention. I heard you preach. I heard you preach to uh, those brothers of the black, you know, go. So it, it, it's just, a, it's part of our culture. Um, we should not shy away from it, uh, regardless if this is on a national stage or not, because in the end, Roland, we have to dictate our narrative. We have to dictate our narrative. And um, there's something to be said for Coach Don Staley uh, to have a brand new starting five. Yep. And to get to... 38 and 0 and sees the national championship because the same five that she had last year rolling that Caitlin them they beat them by four points they had a brand new starting five yep. and they brought the trophy home uh Gavin yeah, see, this is why I was pulling for the Gamecocks. This is why I was pulling for Don Staley. I love to see black coaches win. And as a Southerner, you know, I was, of course, pulling for uh, for South Carolina. But, man, I turned off the game. Uh, I didn't have her speech on, so I missed the sermon, unfortunately. But I thank you, <laughs> I thank you and I thank that brother on Twitter for taking me to church tonight. Uh, I do remember reading that um, Coach Staley you know, she said, you know, yeah, they're 38 and 0, but sometimes she didn't feel that way, right? She didn't feel it. So I don't know. You know, we can only surmise and guess as to the emotional up and down the roller coaster that she was on. We don't see it from where we sit. Right. We see the win after win after win after win after win after win. I could go on to the national championship, but we don't know the struggle that she was facing, you know, just even as a human being, right? Outside of the game or the struggle that people like Angel Reese you know, and others who were, you know, viciously attacked throughout this whole season. And so uh, when she talks about her God, when she talks about our God, you know, we can only imagine, yep. you know, what that's rooted in. And it was an incredible game. And I'm so happy for Coach Staley, an incredible leader, and her team, including the girls who came off the bench and were just dropping buckets. So uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for taking us to church, Roland. Well, <laughs> she, uh, of course, was enjoying the championship trophy, doing the doing her uh, strut, uh, dancing with the trophy in hand. Uh, this is uh, Dawn right here. Turn it up. <laughs> now, now, I told y'all black people do stuff a little bit extra. And so uh, when Don Staley was uh, coming to the arena, she was coming to the arena, uh, they shot a video of her going to the arena. Uh, and, and of course, uh, they had to put this to music as well. Uh, and, and I know uh, this probably drove Jamel Hill and Barry Williams crazy because they're not fans of this song. That's why I'm purposely shouting them out. So I, I had to go ahead and play this one too. Turn of the Mac, South Carolina wins its second national title in three years. They won, uh, of course, two years ago, lost <coughs> in the Final Four last year to Iowa. Won it all this year, going 38 and no. Oh, and a lot of people uh, have been talking about uh, how Don Staley has become the first black coach to win three national titles. But that's actually not correct. She's the first black female coach. She's the first black coach to win it in Division 1A. Vice President Kamala Harris uh, last week actually saluted the first HBCU to win three national championships, and that is Tennessee State. Watch this. Hello, Tigers. We were the first black school to play in an all-small, all-white tournament. And what happened? 
we won the tournament. How many times? Three times. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Three small college championships. Unbelievable. They don't even talk about it. It's not written about it. And basketball is bigger now than it's ever been. Your willingness to tell the story in such an active way is so important. But well, this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to, how to explain it. Just the thing that we went through to be where we are, this is the greatest. This don't get any better than this. These gentlemen and their teammates who we have named are a perfect example of the excellence that comes from our HBCUs and um, I'm incredibly proud. And this is a photo of uh, those players uh, outside of the White House. Uh, they, of course, were not invited when they won. They won uh, the NAIA. Uh, and uh, here they are, 65 years later. Uh, and they won three of those titles. And, uh, you know, for a lot of people out there who, um, you know, it, it, it trips me out, Gavin. You got people out there who say, oh, you know, this is performative. This stuff, this stuff means nothing. It does mean something to those brothers who 65 years later got their just due. They won three national championships. Uh, and so uh, you have had black coach win three national titles. And all too often, and even in, even, even in Caitlin Clark's uh, run, uh, where she became uh, the leading scorer, then people had to remember the other black female players uh, who won, uh, who, 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 of course, who led in scoring. Lynette Woodard and others, uh, people forgot about uh, those individuals, and this is a way to remind people of their greatness. Absolutely. I don't care how old those men were. That was black boy joy, unadulterated black boy joy. It brought joy to my heart definitely to see that and i've seen the photo circulating around on social media and i think it brought joy to a lot of people's hearts and i think it reminds us the vice president alluded to this in what she was saying and some of the um the men did there as well that there's so much history in our community that just got lost to the history books that have gotten lost to the record books it's really important that you know as those today continue to make history that we not forget those who've made history in the past um, and we talk a lot about, you know, talking about some of the, the bad elements of our nation's history, slavery and all of that, and making sure we don't, that those events don't get lost, you know, to the history books. But it's also important that we make sure that these incredible stories of some incredible men who made history don't get lost either. And I know that was genuine. That was authentic for the vice president. She is so proud to be an HBCU alum, to be our nation's first HBCU vice president. You know, she talks about HBCUs as producing, you know, our nation's leaders and their centers of academic excellence. It's why she and the president have been so keen on making sure that our HBCUs get the funding that they deserve, even as Republican states deny public land grain HBCUs the funding that they deserve. And fortunately, the Biden Harris administration unveiled and uncovered this underfunding, and hopefully we'll see the states rectify these injustices. But, you know, you're right. The, these players didn't get their, they didn't get their heroes welcome at the White House when they won their, you know, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back titles. And I really enjoyed working on the vice president's speech last year when she brought uh, the LSU Lady Tigers to the White House. It was really cool seeing Angel Reese and all that. And, you know, the vice president cares very deeply. She's a huge sports fan. Um, but, you know, as much as he cares about sports, she cares even more, you know, about our HBCUs and making sure that we recognize our HBCU students and graduates, including the athletes, you know, for the greatness and the excellence that they display on and off the court or the field. Uh, and, of course, while we're doing that, uh, go to my iPad. Uh, now, remember, Caitlin Clark has Division I a scoring record, but the most points ever scored uh, by a woman in college basketball history is Pearl Moore of Florence, South Carolina. She scored 4,061 points. She played for Francis Marion University from 1975 to 1979. And, Derek, she did it without a three-point line. Mm. You know, for me, Roland, this is about justice. 
a lot of our trailblazers did not get their accolades, did not get their flowers. Uh, as I watch uh, that video that you were just showing, um, the, the, what about the players who have gone on to glory, right? You're talking about 65 years ago, Roland. So what about those who are part of that team that did not get the invitation? And so this is about justice. Uh, this is about uh, uh, giving the flowers to our trailblazers. This is about demonstrating the contributions that we make to every industry uh, in the United States, from corporate America to sports to, to media, um, broadcasters such as yourself. This is about justice, all right? This is not something, that a handout or nothing. This is something about making sure that you acknowledge black excellence. This is making sure that uh, our trailblazers uh, get their due awards just like everyone else. Uh, this is about justice for me. Uh, and uh, also, I just want people to also, again, when we're talking about, and I, I did a, do my radio commentary on this, uh, and it is, not, it is not meant to take away from Caitlin Clark. Uh, but one of the things that I remind people of, and that is, I, it kills me when people talk about Michael Jordan, uh, you know, dominating the NBA, uh, and, and he's responsible for the NBA growth. And I got to remind people uh, that before there was Michael Jordan, there was Magic Johnson, there was Larry Bird. Before there was Magic and Bird, there was Dr. J, there was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell, Oscar Robinson. So the reality is, every generation has a player. So there's Caitlin Clark, but then let's, let's not forget Meyer Moore, Cheryl Miller, Lynette Woodard, and on and on and on. And we're talking about that I also want folks to remember uh, Lucia Harris Stewart. She died in 2022, uh, and her story was a documentary was done on her. It actually won the Oscar uh, for documentary. And this sister here, uh, she scored the first basket in a women's Olympics uh, Olympic competition, and she was the first woman ever drafted by an NBA team. That's how bad Tylee this sister was when it came to playing basketball. You know, I, I, I'm going to keep, I, I'm going to echo the words of Coach Don. You know, we live in uncommon favor. And I think black people overall through our history, through our pain and our beauty, it has always been uncommon favor. And I, and I live in that optimism. I, I live, you know, in that, in, in that, in that hope uh, that, you know, though they may ch try to tear us down, it is, it is our resilience. It is our culture. We are the culture. We got the juice. We got the sauce. We got it all. And so uh, we are living in, in uncommon favor, and I'm excited for the great things that uh, we will continue to do because we, we we break glass ceilings, we shatter 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 ceilings, and we uh we we, we do the darn thing. So uh, shout out to Black people. Uh, black. Uh, last year, uh, this has caused uh, a, a lot of controversy because um, um, you know uh, Lynette Woodard. Uh, she held uh, the collegiate record, uh, the, 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 big, the big division collegiate record that Caitlin Clark uh, did break. Now, yes, and when Lynette Woodard uh, held it, uh, it was a different time. They did not play with a smaller basketball. There was no three-point line. She actually said that a couple of days ago, uh, and a lot of people have not been happy with these comments here. Watch this here. Uh, I am the hidden figure, but no longer now. Uh, my record was hidden. Uh, from everyone for 43 years, 43 years. Uh, I don't think, uh, I'll just go ahead and get the out of the room. Uh, I don't think my record has been broken uh, because you can't duplicate what you're not duplicating. And uh, so unless you come with a men's basketball and a two-point shot, hey, you know. So that caused a lot of controversy because, uh, you know, look, the, you know, Iowa celebrated her, brought Lynette Woodard in. She was well received by the fan base. Uh, and even their uh, head basketball coach, uh, when they were talking about uh, Caitlin Clark breaking the record, said, well, th the real record was the one held by Lynette Woodard that was broken. This is what uh, their coach had to say. Um, to me, 
you know, for the AIAW record that Lynette Weddard held, um, that was the real one. You know, for some reason, the NCAA does not want to recognize the basketball that was played prior to 1982, and that's wrong. Um, we played basketball back then. They just don't want to recognize it. And that hurts the rest of us that were playing at that time. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason why that should not be the true record. And, um, you know, at a school like Iowa that has been so rich in AIAW history, um, I just want to make sure we acknowledge Lynette's accomplishments in, in the game of basketball. But congratulations to Caitlin for being the true basketball leader in points tonight. You know, the NCAA didn't want to recognize women and what they did um, back in the 1980s. Um, and, you know, I think it just speaks to the foundation that these players have laid for us to have opportunities to be able to play in environments, environments like this and in front of crowds like this. Um, so I wouldn't have the opportunity to be able to do what I'm doing every single night if it wasn't for people like her. And um, obviously there's so many great players across the board. So um, I'm just really thankful and grateful to have those people that have come before me. Um, and yeah, it's, it's super special. Um, you know, obviously she's one of the best all times, could certainly score the ball. Um, but I think it just shows, you know, Title IX is not that long ago. 50 years is not that long ago. Um, and I think it just still shows the room that we have to improve and um, where women's sports is, is going is a really great place. Tonight is the night of the... Uh, and again, uh, the, uh, Lynette's comments uh, did cause a little stir, and so uh, she did release a statement uh, on social media uh, stating, you know, sort of clarify, clarifying uh, her remarks. Uh, and I'm going to pull it up. You know, but, but here, here's the... I get her point. But the reality is, I think when it comes to any record, I mean, li listen, Pistol Pete Maravich, uh, you know, his record was broken, but when he played, there was no three-point line. Uh, in the NFL, I remember you had Deacon Jones who complained about Bruce Smith and then Michael Strahan being the NFL sacks leader. They didn't count sacks when Deacon Jones was playing. Uh, Deacon Jones actually went back and watched all of his games to count his own sacks. So, so I, and so, I mean, listen, I don't care if you're a player, uh, uh, Derek, you don't you don't want you don't want to be forgotten. You don't want to act like your stuff didn't matter. Uh, but I, I I do think I mean I get Lynette's point. Uh, she's a, she was a phenomenal player. But uh, the reality is, listen, when the record is broken, you can't say well they had better track shoes, better tracks. They had this, they had that. It is what it is. The, but the the you're right, Roland. But the reality is, a lot of our textbooks do not include black contributions. And I think that's the part that gives um, black men and black women the rub, especially those who played the game. I mean, folks don't even know about Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points in a game because nobody talks about it. It's not written nowhere. And so when- Oh, no, no, it's, hold on, it's written because that record ain't been broken. <laughs> that, 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 you, you I mean, Col Col Colby scored what, 80, 81? He still didn't score 100. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, but, but, but those types of records, although it was done 50, 60 years ago, um, folks can always say, well, we changed the distance from the goal. Yep. Uh, you know, those two kind of things. Or, and folks are faster and, and quicker and taller now. I guess the bottom line, Roland, um, it, it, you know, and I saw someone tweet this the other day, yesterday, as a matter of fact, after South Carolina won. They said, can you be the greatest of all time if you never had a trophy or a ring? Actually, you can. Right? No, no, I'm just saying that was a rhetorical yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think people get, listen, I think people get caught up. I think people get caught up in, in all sorts of, you know, well, how can you be the greatest? How can you be this here? First of all, they're all subjective. So there, is, there actually is no, there's no standard, there's no objective standard to actually measure greatness. Uh, I've seen Gil Are Gilbert Arenas was like, oh, well, you can't say Bill Russell was the greatest because during that time there were only eight NBA teams and they were mostly white as if Bill Russell couldn't have played in any era. So then you hear the era stuff. Then you say, well, the guys today are bigger and faster and, oh, he would have been outweighed and, oh, this whole deal. And But the reality is, here's the whole deal. Kareem and Wilt, they actually changed the rules. They change the rules because of their domination. And so I, I hear that all the time, and it just sort of drives me crazy uh, because here's the deal. 
Charles Barkley never, never, ne never won a ring. Is he arguably the greatest power forward ever? Yep. Carl Malone never won a ring. John Stockton is the leader in assist uh, and, and, and steals, all that. One of the greatest point guards? Yeah, it's no lie. So I, I just think people get caught up in that. Uh, here was a statement from Lynette Woodard. She issued this on Instagram. To clarify my remarks made at an award ceremony on Saturday, no one respects Caitlin Clark's accomplishments more than I do. This is why I accepted Iowa's invitation to participate in Caitlin's senior day. My message was a lot has changed on and off the court, which makes it difficult to compare statistical, statistical accomplishments from different eras. Each is a snapshot in time. Caitlin holds a scoring record. I salute her and will be cheering for her throughout the rest of her career. I mean, so... Yeah, we can make the, all the distinctions, Tyler. Like, look, it is what it is. Uh, but the bottom line is, I, but, but it is important, I think, if you are historians, if you are others, uh, to, to, as I said earlier, don't act as if the people before Caitlin Clark never existed. And I, think yeah, exactly. we, and, I think, and I think we see that even in other sports, as if people only look at what they see in their era as opposed to what happened 30, 40, 50 years before. Go ahead. No, I'll say that. exactly. I think it's important that we that we uh, honor and acknowledge the the, the fact that um, <clears throat> she was the lead, leading scorer. It, it, each generation has has, as you said, different different folks, and so it's important to highlight and acknowledge those folks. Kevin and their contribution to the sport. Yeah, I think both things can be true, right? We got to celebrate Lynette Woodard for the dominance that she displayed on the court. You know, just as now, we ought to celebrate Caitlin Clark, you know, for breaking that record and for her continued dominance. I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing what she does in the WNBA too. And I think it's important that through all of this, right? And I and I think Lynette and, and Caitlin were in many, you know, they they were really agreeing on, I think, a fundamental truth, you know, which is that. I think we could all agree, we should all agree that women's sports, it's incredible the growth and popularity that we've seen, you know, among women's sports in the past, um, you know, the past number of years, we've seen interest just continue to increase and increase because of incredible, you know, athletes like Caitlin Clark and, and, and so many others who have come um, before. I'm just using her as a modern example. So let's all celebrate the fact that tonight, for example, many people think that the men's game will not get anywhere near the number of, of views that yesterday's you know women's game got and in fact, and in fact yesterday's woman's yeah. yesterday's championship actually the last three games of caitlin clark's career all three games broke the television record uh for and it just went higher and higher the game uh the game uh on yesterday 18.4 million watched that game and so uh, given go ahead yeah no i think that's so important to recognize. And also what I read today is that there were more bets placed on the LSU Iowa game that happened when was that last week uh, than all the NHL and all but one MLB and NBA games that happened in the week before that. So we're continuing to just see this incredible explosion yep. Yep. in interest and demand, you know, and if you look at uh, the top, I think five highest uh, earning uh, college athletes from the standpoint of name, image, and likeness, or NIL, you know, you've got folks like Caitlin Clark in there who I think bringing home like three plus million dollars like this year, Angel Reese thing also hit a million dollars. Like you're seeing finally, finally a recognition and, and an acknowledgement of just the incredible, you know, excellence of, of women athletes across all sports. And so I'm excited to see, you know, uh, interest and enthusiasm and passion for women's sports continue to uh, to continue to grow. And obviously it's important that along the way that uh, we make sure that we're writing down and keeping accurate records of the women who are continuing to make history. So I just think it's important for us to not lose sight of the forest through the trees, which is that it's a good thing that we all ought to celebrate um, where women's sports are now versus where they, where they were before. And, you know, amazing uh, the progress we've made and that the sport will continue uh, to make among fans in the years ahead. Um, go to my iPad. Uh, the numbers are clear. Check this out. This is from Richard Deitch. Uh, the, the women's game, it drew more than all but four college football games in 2023. It outdrew every World Series games since Game 7 of the 2019 World Series. It outdrew every NBA Finals game since Game 5 of the 2017 NBA Finals. It, is, it outdrew every Daytona 500 race since 2006, and the Masters is this week. It is, the Masters is considered the preeminent uh, uh, golf, uh, golf major. 
The finals yesterday outdrew every Masters final round viewership, which includes Tiger Woods, since 2001. That shows you how much interest. Last point, I'll make this here. There was somebody on our YouTube channel said, well, Roland, uh, you're wrong because they, they measure greatness by titles. Guess what? The two greatest, base, two greatest baseball hitters of all time, Ted Williams and Tony Gwynn, never won a World Series. Barry Bonds, who owns the uh, career record, one of the greatest hitters in all of Major League Baseball history, never won a World Series. So this notion that you can't be a great player unless you win a title, it's a lie. Just saying. All right, going to a break. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Hey, yo, what's up? It's Mr. Dalvin right here. What's up? This is KC. Sitting here representing the J-O-D-E-C artist, Jodeci. Right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, uh, it is National Minority Health Month, Black Maternal Health Week, uh, and that latter issue has really gotten lots of attention. Vice President Kamala Harris has made this a significant priority with black maternal uh, mortality rate three times higher than white women. Uh, but did you know that women are most vulnerable to dying after childbirth? And the studies have shown that uh, the leading cause of maternal death uh, is mental health conditions. Dr. Veronica Gillespie-Bell is the medical director of quality uh, at uh, Austria Health Women's Services. Joins us from New Orleans, Louisiana. Glad to have you here. Um, you know, this has gotten lots, like I said, the vice president has really made this a significant priority. Uh, and, and we're seeing more attention paid to it because this is not just an issue that poor women are facing. Middle class, upper middle class. Uh, Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton was on earlier. She talked about uh, Serena Williams, what she endured. So this is an issue that people have to recognize. Income ain't, ain't the, the, the determining factor. Absolutely. When we look at the data, in fact, a black woman with a college degree is twice as likely as a white woman with an eighth grade education to experience a maternal mortality. So as you pointed out, it's not just about education. It's not about the haves and the have nots. It is about the fact that black women are being mistreated. And when you say mistreated, walk us through that. Yeah, so when we think about disparities, it's always going to boil down to two things, systemic racism and implicit bias. And when I speak of implicit bias, I'm speaking of that unconscious bias that individuals have towards other individuals. Uh, in particular, when we think about that unconscious bias in Black women, the way that we have been characterized throughout history, uh, the negative stereotypes then starts to affect how doctors nurses, providers within the healthcare system interact with us. 
I think probably the worst, most damaging stereotype that has been put on black women is the stereotype of the angry black woman. And what happens is when we voice an issue, we voice a concern, often we are ignored because we're seen as the angry black woman. Mm -hmm. And then ourselves, we don't want to be that stereotype. So then we sometimes don't speak up when we do need to speak up. Well, in fact, um, um, I'm trying to pull it up uh, one second. As, as you were talking, uh, I remember during COVID, um, there was this, there was a black woman, uh, and she was a nurse and she was going off about her care and folks were talking about her and it's like, oh my God, she's angry. She eventually died. She was yelling and she was like, I'm a, I know what's going on with my body and they were not listening to this sister. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what happened to Serena Williams. Serena Williams said, I am short of breath. She went on to say, I have a history of blood clots in my family. And she had to become pretty irate before they actually listened to her, got a CT scan and saw that she actually did have a blood clot in her lungs. And that's when you're Serena Williams. You have everything at your hand. You have all of the power. You have all of the celebrity and still what no one can see past your black skin to listen to you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, questions from the panel. Uh, Gavin, you first. Thank you so much for joining us, um, doctor. I think what's incredible to me uh, is the hypocrisy that we're seeing from extremist Republican lawmakers who claim to care about life. They claim to be pro-life, but they're pushing policies that restrict women's access to reproductive care. And we're seeing, you know, this happen, especially in a lot of states with high populations of black women. And uh, the vice president, Kamala Harris, you referenced uh, Roland a minute ago, who I worked for, uh, she speaks very clearly about this hypocrisy that many of the same states that are enacting these uh, bans or restrictions on accessing reproductive care are some of the same states with some of the highest rates of maternal mortality. Again, right, the hypocrisy could not be more clear. So I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about that phenomenon, right? What are the impacts, what are the implications of these restrictions on reproductive freedom uh, that we've seen so far? Yes, yeah, thank you so much for that, um, that question. And I'm so honored that um, Vice President Kamala Harris has put so much attention on this issue. I was um, honored to be a speaker at the Maternal Health Day of Action uh, when she first re uh, re released a package around working around maternal health. I think that it's important for us as citizens to pay attention to what is going on right now. As you mentioned, in some of the most restrictive states in terms of re reproductive access is where we have our worst outcomes. This is just another example of how systemic policies then start to impact black and brown people and how we can have worsening health outcomes about for that. And so it's really important as community advocates, as, as individuals that we pay attention and we use our voice in the way that we vote. And that is really the only way that this is going to change. Tyler. Yeah, thank you so much for your leadership on this. I'm a proud product of a black woman and every day her black son is committed to fighting for the rights of <laughs> justice and freedom. Um, so as we continue to echo that black women, as you mentioned, are two to three times more likely to die from complications, we must also leverage resources to ampl amplify uh, reproductive justice and freedom. Are there organizations or campaigns that folks that are tuned in and watching that they can engage in? And uh, what resources can they tap into? Yes. So I would encourage everybody to go to the CDC website to the Hear Her campaign. It is a great campaign with a lot of resources on what you can do if you are a, a Black woman or an individual who is pregnant, how you can advocate for yourself in the birth space. Also, to make you aware of the warning signs, uh, as Roland mentioned from the statistics, we know that the majority of deaths are actually not occurring in the hospital. They're occurring from the time patients are discharged 
up to one year postpartum with a, the greatest number being in the first six weeks. And so it's really important that as we are going into pregnancy as black women, but also for our support systems, for our community, for those that love us and that are around us to understand what those post-birth warning signs are so that you know when to come back into the hospital and to know when something is wrong. And again, knowledge is power. And so the CDC Hear Her campaign gives all of us that knowledge to know what to advocate for. Um, and actually, I was talking about that black nurse. She actually was a doctor. It was Dr. Susan Moore. And she complained about racist treatment uh, at, a, at the Inter Indiana University uh, Hospital. This is actually uh, some of what she, I'm going to play in a second. Give me a second. Uh, some of what she had to say. And, and like I said, I remember this during uh, COVID uh, and folks simply were not listening. The second worst day at IU North. <clears throat> Yesterday, a Dr. Bannock, B A N N E C, wanted to send me home. You know, at that time, I'd only received two treatments of the Remdesivir. He said, Ah, oh, you don't need it. You're not even short of breath. I said, Yes, I am. Then he went on to say, you don't qualify. I must have because um, I've gotten two treatments. And then he further stated, you should just go home right now. And I don't feel comfortable giving you any more narcotics. in so much pain from my neck. My neck hurt so bad. I was crushed. He made me feel like I was a drug addict. And he knew I was a physician. I don't take narcotics. I was hurting. So, spoke to patient advocate who left me wanting. Um, there's not much I can do. So I started asking, send me to another hospital where they can treat me. And if they're not gonna treat me here properly, send me to another hospital. Well, next thing I know, I'm getting a stat. That right there, Doc, I mean, here's a black doctor explaining what's going on. And you heard her say, the doctor said, I'm not giving you any more narcotics. I referenced that earlier, where early on in the opioid crisis, racism actually helped black people because racist white doctors were not prescribing opioids to African-Americans because, like this doctor, assumed, assumed that black people were trying to get their fix. Yeah, it's really, really unfortunate. And uh, again, we see it play out time and time again from in multiple stories. Um, and it's all because of bias and implicit bias and bias beliefs. I mean, back in slavery time, they tried to make race a biological condition as a way to explain slavery and a, a way to advocate for slavery. And slavery and, and all of those ill uh, ways that we were treated and the ways that they came up to try to advocate and, and agree for slavery are so ingrained in our society now that it has become a way of a thought process and we see it, we see it play out in medicine. We see uh, from a study that was done at the University of Virginia with um, over 200 white medical students, white residents, over 50% of them believe that black people have thicker skin, have different nerve endings and do not feel pain in the same way. And so if you are believing that and you are a healthcare provider and you have a black patient that is saying they're in pain, 
are you going to really treat them appropriately? The answer is no. The data shows it. The greater that belief was that Black people don't feel pain in the same way, the less likely those residents and medical students were to adequately treat those patients' pain. There. Um, Dr. Bell, I appreciate your work uh, in this space. Um, Georgia is ground zero when it comes to maternal health. We're ground zero. 169 women lost their lives last year just simply trying to give birth. 776 children, infants died. Uh, in fact, uh, my constituent, um, she heard me at the press conference, Dr. Bell, and she said, uh, Representative Jackson, my mother died three months after I was born. That was 50 years ago. And so a state like Georgia, where 82 counties out of 159 do not have an OBGYN, 62 counties do not have a pediatrician. Uh, we yet to expand Medicaid here in Georgia, but yet we sit on $16 billion surplus. My question to you, what can we do here in Georgia um, to help mitigate uh, this maternal and infant mortality that we're seeing? Because we got CDC right in our backyard, and we're not throwing up our hands here. Uh, we're trying to get out the vote. We're talking about all these issues in this election cycle. But yet, 169 women died here in Georgia, and we rank dead last when it comes to women's health because the number of counties uh, do not have an OBGYN and a pediatrician. Yeah, it is really, really sad to, to hear those numbers and to know that that, that is the, the, the reality. And you're right, and the CDC is right there. I'll be there actually this week um, where we're talking about maternal mortality. Um, and it really has to be fought on so many fronts. Um, it is about the expansion of Medicaid. We've already talked about the majority of deaths are occurring after delivery. Medicaid only extends coverage up to 60 days postpartum. Well, there's a lot of stuff happening between 60 days and, and, and one year. And so there is federal movement to do more with the waivers, um, to have states extend Medicaid to one year postpartum. And again, I will always go back to the community needs to be aware of this so that they can vote. Um, so they can can get out the the, the vote as their their voice and their power. Um, it's, it's also about um, going from the the ground up and 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 working with with grassroots organizations. I think that's one of the things that we have seen here in uh, Louisiana that's been very helpful. Um, working with the March of Dimes and, and there are plenty other organizations that are not big name organizations um, that are, are actually working to advocate, working with legislators, working to be the voice of the community. We're constantly, I think, as, as healthcare systems and, uh, and, and different uh, organizations trying to design solutions for the community, but not talking to the community to hear what the community needs. And so, um, I, I, again, we've seen a lot of movement here in Louisiana. Louisiana, just from these grassroots organizations that are community-based organizations, doula organizations, midwife organizations, they're in the community. They know what the community needs, and they're talking to the legislators and getting, getting those actions um, moved. On a federal level, um, and I know that the vice president has done a lot of, of work around this, but we have to, to start identifying and removing those barriers to, one, practicing in rural areas, but also for midwives. We are the only high-income country, or one of the only high-income countries, that does not have midwifery practice integrated into our obstetric health care system. Some states are doing it better than others, and those are states that have more independent practice for midwives. But we have got to incorporate midwives as part of our practice in the United States, or our, our system is going to fail. The data already shows that by 2030, we are going to be short 5,000 OBGYNs 
here in the South, 2,700. And you're already experiencing it in Georgia. We are experiencing it in Louisiana. We're seeing it in Mississippi. We're hearing every day about hospitals closing in, in Alabama and, and shortages in Alabama. So we we have to think about who the healthcare workforce is, and it's not just obstetricians. We have to work on expanding our midwives and also our doulas. All right, then. Uh, well, Doc, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, and so hopefully uh, folks will uh, understand uh, how significant this issue is, and we definitely need action on the federal level, but also on the state level as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, Derek, Tylek, and Gavin, I appreciate y'all being on today's show. Thank you so very much, gentlemen. I uh, hope you have uh, a great day. Folks, uh, don't forget, support us in what we do. Uh, our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average 50 bucks each a year. That's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. Uh, the goal is to raise a million dollars for the work that we do when it comes to covering the news that matters. You can see your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196. Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash out, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. You can also, uh, of course, download the Blackstone Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, you can watch our 24-hour, seven-day-week streaming channel available on Amazon News by going to Amazon Fire. You can also tell Alexa play news from the Blackstone Network. We are on Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, Amazon Prime Video. Be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available at bookstores nationwide. Get the audio version on Audible. Yes, it's me reading it. Folks, until then, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Actually, tomorrow I'm going to be at the uh, Yale Public Policy Conference with Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, so I'll be speaking there. So, uh, Carol, who's filling in tomorrow? I'm a Congo to Binga uh, is going to be uh, sitting in the chair for me tomorrow. I'll be live from Augusta on Wednesday and Thursday. And so that's it. I'll see you all tomorrow. Holla! Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. Mm -hmm. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?